sports and fitness. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking all of you for coming, especially our panelists. Um, we really appreciate it. My name is Jacob, and I'm a career assistant at the St. John's Resource Center, which is sponsoring this event. Um, so how tonight's going to work is I'm going to start off by introducing each of the panelists, and then they're going to give their own introduction of themselves and how they got to where they are today um, and how they use their uh, education at St. John's and St. Ben's to get them there. And then after that, we're going to have a question and answer series where you can just ask questions that you have, um, and then they'll answer them. And then after that, lastly, uh, we'll end around 8. And then after that, you can stand, the panelists will stick around, and you can ask them questions if you have any. Um, so now I'll start off by introducing each of the panelists. Um, first here, we have Sarah Krasinski. She teaches Pilates in St. Cloud and Eden Prairie. Uh, to her right, we have John Tuvey. He works at the Huddle. Uh, to her, his right, we have Mackenzie Ludewies. She works with the Minnesota Wild. To the right, we have Joe Henry. He works at Lake of the Woods. To his right, we have Jen Myers, who works at Minnesota State University, M Mankato. And lastly, we have Patrick McCarty, who works at Zebra Mats. Without any further ado, I'll let Sarah get started. Hi, I'm Sarah Krasinski. I went to the St. Ben's in 2002. I graduated with a liberal studies major. I got interested in Pilates doing the, the dance program here. It had just started my um, junior and senior year. After I graduated, I, I, whoops, I'm getting feedback. There. I um, pursued my passion for Pilates down Eden Prairie. I went through training with Lana Masao. And it was like a six to nine month training period. We had classes for six months. Then I had to do an internship for three months there. And since then, I've been working about 10 hours a week down there teaching Pilates and gyrotonics. Gyrotonics is a whole different separate um, education from Pilates. And that was another about six month training program going at about 12 days at a time over the six month period. Um, let's see what else. So a typical work day for me, uh, I usually work out in the morning and then I will have clients anywhere from noon to seven o'clock at night. <laughs> and I, I teach mostly one-on-one -on -one sessions. So I'll do like an hour session with one person. Once in a while, we'll have two people. And then I teach her former classes twice a week also. I'm John Tuvey. My official title is a senior NFL analyst at thehuddle.com, which is a fantasy football website. I also do a uh, show on KFAN on Saturdays during the football season. I also co-host a show on Sirius XM on Thursday nights during the football season. Um, I also write for various publications such as the USA Today NFL Draft Guide. Um, I was a management major at St. John's um, with a communications minor and uh, that's kind of where uh, I focused on writing classes. Uh, the year that I the year that I uh, started or graduated was the first year that they had a communications minor. So I kind of invented a lot of my classes one year um, during J term when they still had J term. Uh, I and a couple other football players produced, wrote, directed, starred in um, two half hour television shows for the campus cable channel called Johnny Sports Tonight. Um, I also did a, a seven credit summer internship writing for my local paper. Um, so. It wasn't just classwork like a problem stats class or strategic planning class or anything related to my degree, but also stuff I did outside uh, the class. Um, I was also the sports editor of the St. Ben's paper. Do they still have separate papers or is there just one combined now? Just one? At, at the time that uh, when I was a junior, um, the St. Ben's paper had been dormant for a while and there were some people that wanted to start it back up. And it was a great opportunity for me because had I written for the St. John's paper, I would have been starting at the bottom end of the hierarchy and there's no way I would have been uh, thrown into the job of being sports editor. Uh, but not only writing, uh, managing a staff, um, interviewing people, but also uh, the desktop publishing skills I picked up at that time were actually my foot in the door uh, on numerous occasions, uh, actually in getting my first job in the fantasy sports industry. Um, I did design layout and production for a magazine with writing on the side and as we got bigger um, I phased out the design and focused more on the writing. Um, a typical day during the uh, NFL season which uh, 
for me runs from August through December. Um, I work about uh, conservatively 100 hours a week during that portion of the season, um, writing different articles, um, player rankings. Um, if I'm not writing, I'm reading, I'm trying to figure out what's going on, analyzing stats, watching games. Um, the bell cow uh, product of the huddle is the start bench list, which I break down every player, every team, and what they're going to do that week against that opponent. Um, that's about a 12,000 word article that comes out every Wednesday. Um, during the off season, which is now, uh, I'll be covering the NFL draft, I'll be covering free agency. Once the draft happens, I'll start writing profiles for uh, going into uh, the coming season. Um, I also do, as I mentioned, the two radio shows and also probably a half dozen other appearances during the season on stations ranging from the St. Cloud affiliate um, of KFAN to uh, ESPN Tampa to Fox Sports Radio, uh, JT the Brick overnight show. Um, those are sporadic during the off season, but usually on a weekly basis during the season. So I try and take everything that I do uh, for the paying job of writing for the huddle and uh, uh, use that as well um, uh, for the radio shows to, uh, to uh, repurpose that, uh, that work. Um, there isn't really a typical, a typical day for me. Um, it's, uh, it's a great uh, gig for someone who loves football. Uh, and the, the short version is uh, I get to watch football and get paid for it. All right, I'm Mackenzie Ludewies, and I work for the Minnesota Wild. My current title is Corporate Fulfillment Coordinator. So as part of my job, I um, work obviously in corporate sponsorship, but I do not sell corporate sponsorship. I am more on the activation side. So when we prepare to go and pre um, present to clients for possible sponsorships, I create proposals. And then once those sponsorships have come in and we've made contracts and everything, I'm the one who um, then takes everything that the sponsorship entails, whether it's arena signage, TV, radio, website, um, different promotions we have during our in-games, such as intermission activities, giveaways, and things like that. I make sure that that is all done. Um, we call that activation, just um, ensuring that every contract is has met every agreement. So um, a typical day for me is pretty different now compared to what it will be in like in three weeks when we are done since we will not be going to playoffs. Um, I usually do radio if we have TV I plan all of our radio spots so every sponsor gets a certain number of radio spots depending on their contract if they have radio if they don't so every game I plan all of our radio show um, place spots I even have a few spots in my own voice um, I plan our TV so each game, we have a certain number of spots through FSN that I place our spots that are contracted. Um, I make sure that every arena signage is fulfilled according to the contract. So if, if you've ever been to a hockey game, um, especially professional, they have what are called dasher boards around the rink. We have signage. I make sure that um, each sponsor who has a spot is up and it's the correct logo, things like that. Um, we have to take them out quite a bit, so I make sure that they're placed correctly back in. Um, if we have open spots, I put certain people there. We also have rotating dashers, which are a computer um, eyes version of their logo. I do a rotation for that, and it switches every game. Um, I also do um, our website. I make sure that different banner ads that sponsors have requested are up to date, and they're on the website. They're active. They're going to the correct link. They are reaching a certain number of people. Uh, and let's see, what else do I do? Um, I also work on recaps then towards the end of the season. So my day is pretty, um, it's different every day. If we have a game, you know, it's a lot busier. We're um, preparing a lot for the game. Uh, but if it's a non-game day, we're just catching up to, um, catching up with our daily proposals and recaps and things like that. When I went to St. Ben's, I graduated in 2008. I went to school for accounting thinking I was going to be an accountant. And I actually went on to grad school at the U for accounting and decided it just was not for me. So I got an internship at the U of M in Gopher Athletics, working with the administrative staff. So I worked with Joel Maturi, the athletic director, and the other athletic directors underneath him. And they really pers um, pushed me to pursue my dream of working in sports. So I switched to um, my master's program and got my master's in sports management and got an internship with the Minnesota Wild last season and was fortunate enough to be hired this year. So, um, you know, it's, I went from accounting to sports I actually do use some of my accounting background in my daily job. 
uh, I do, um, when, we, when we actually get a sponsor, I work with the contract and make sure um, the payment terms are set up, different um, fees are taken out for agencies that work with the sponsors and things like that. We have our own accounting department, but um, we also need to do our end of the deal as well. I also do invoicing for our TV and radio, so it involves a lot of math and things like that. So my accounting is not out the window, and who knows, someday I might be back to it. But right now, um, I'm down, you know, I'm down a different um, road. Um, that's pretty much it. Hi, everybody. My name is Joe Henry, and I'm the Executive Director of Tourism for Lake of the Woods. So I thought what I would do is maybe just give you kind of run through, I'll give you a background on my education, and then I'll maybe just give you a, a chronological picture of kind of how I came up to where I'm at now, I might give you a good understanding of at least you know, some ideas on how to get to what you want, and then we can go from there. So um, I have a, a degree in football from St. John. <laughs> Wait a second, I said wrong to yeah. yeah. Okay, no, a degree in management, and I played football at St. John. That's what it is. By the way, I played football, that guy right there. And I was a running back, and he was a lineman, so you can see, uh, you know, we had a lot of success. <laughs> but you know, I'll tell you what, he's got the easiest name to remember in the world. If you forget John Tooby's name, just go like this, go two V. Two right? That's right, John. All right. <laughs> we're, we, we're good buddies with the way back, as you can probably tell. But, uh, but I, I have a, uh, seriously, I have a management degree from St. John's University, and uh, <laughs> About 10 years later in life, I had an opportunity with a, a company I was working with. Uh, they offered if, if I wanted to give up a couple years of my life, they'd take my, my MBA. So I have an MBA as well. I have that from uh, Baldwin Wallace College, which is a similar school to, to St. John's and St. Ben's Division III school. They're out of basically Cleveland, Ohio, uh, Rio, Ohio, southern suburb. Um, you know, and I was going to say, I was going to tell everybody here, you know what, kudos for you to go into college and stay on track. You know what the stats are for somebody that goes to college versus somebody who doesn't go to college as far as earning potential? You know, the fact that you're going to get a college degree, you're going to make over a million dollars more than somebody who doesn't. So no matter what you do, stay on track because that's your ticket. So, um, my pathway, you know, I started out going to St. John's. I, uh, I'm from St. Cloud. Uh, I had to, in order to make it at St. John's because there wasn't athletic scholarships, I had to do, I felt a little bit more to pay my way. So in addition to the loans and the grants and the, the uh, um, work studies and all the good stuff at St. John's, um, during the summers, instead of doing some of the more traditional jobs of all things, they're going to laugh, I sold Kirby home care systems. Mm -hmm. And I, I call them home care systems because when they're about 1800 bucks, they're no longer a vacuum cleaner. You won't sell very many. So I sold Kirby's three out of my four summers at St. John's. And I did real well at it. So when I got out of college, I decided to go into Kirby full time. And uh, I ended up uh, right out of college. Uh, I was a you know, sales manager and a recruiter, and then I got my own office. Shortly after that, in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, I had you know a crew of salespeople. I had telemarketing staff. I had a service department. I had a whole business. And uh, and then I did that for a couple of years. Then I had an opportunity to become a, a Kirby consultant in the five state area. So I went around to different offices and basically helped them become more successful. And I had an opportunity to become a larger Kirby distributor in Brooklyn Center. If any of you guys are from the cities, I was right at the corner of Shingle, Park, Shingle Creek Parkway in 694, right at the, the intersection of the highways. And a good recruiting base there. You know, people could find me. And uh, so I did that a couple years there, and then I got an invitation to go to the world headquarters of Kirby, uh, which is in Cleveland, Ohio. And I became uh, the Kirby Company's director of education and training. So I got to uh, write training manuals, do videos, be on TV. A lot, of, a lot of educational stuff for uh, Kirby people in 66 different countries on how to not only sell Kirby's but also run a more effective business. Um, and then from there, I, I was there for four years in Cleveland. And then I came back to St. Cloud and I worked for another direct sales company called Creative Memories, which is based out of St. Cloud. That's a scrapbooking company. They do a, you know, they, they do a, I guess they call it a, a home class, teaching people how to scrapbook. And you've been doing that home class, you sell product because people get enthused by it. So I was, I was director of international sales for Creative Memories, and then I, uh, I ended up becoming a, a vice president of marketing for a firm out in Philadelphia. And then uh, I was there a couple of years, and I, uh, I wanted to come back to Minnesota, and I came back to Minnesota and became my own, I had my own consulting business. I had Joe Henry Consulting, real original, right? Mm -hmm. I, was, I was given the advice that don't come up with some wacky name because people won't be able to find it. You better uh, 
calling me who you are so people can find you if they want to. So I did. And it was just me. So it was low overhead. I worked out of my home. I didn't uh, have an office or anything. And I worked with small to mid-sized companies throughout Central Minnesota on a variety of projects. team sales meetings. I did, uh, I was a national sales manager, a one-year interim national sales manager at the Cold Spring brand. I helped them open up a new division. I, uh, I became a, a sales director for a startup software company here in St. Cloud to get their, them up and running. So they got a staff in place um, and a lot of other projects too. It was, it was a lot of fun. And then um, um, about two and a half years ago, I, I got an opportunity. Somebody contacted me to become to, to work for a large consulting company out of Baltimore. And basically it would have been sales. And uh, So I worked for a company called RWD Technologies. And basically what we did is we sold uh, different types of you know, uh, strategic planning and um, adult learning and uh, lean techniques and, and manufacturing solutions to Fortune 500 companies. My territory was uh, the Midwest. Midwest uh, it was Minnesota, North South Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska. And I worked out of my home office. You can do that nowadays virtually, right? With a laptop and a smartphone. People don't know where in the heck they are. As long as I can keep my dog quiet, we're good to go. Um, so I, I did that for a little over two years. And I got a call. The way I got my job at Lake of the Woods Tourism is I got a call. I had been going up to Lake of the Woods fishing um, on my own and, uh, for probably 20 years. And I befriended uh, some of the resort owners up there. And so they knew my they knew my business acumen just because we've had conversations about their business, and I just naturally kicked in and talked to them about building their business better. Uh, and then also my fishing background. You know, I uh, I'm a licensed charter captain of the Coast Guard, and I also fish walleye tournaments. And uh, just about turned the switch pro, I decided not to. And, uh, so they knew of me that way, and they contacted me when this position came open and said, "Hey, you'd be great at it." Blah blah blah. And at the time I had a job, I said, "You know, I just I'm, I'm pretty good right now, but boy, it'd be fun. But I, I just can't." You know? Well, a lot of life has to do with time and place. My company, um, RWD Technologies, was purchased by another company. And I started seeing some of my colleagues fall by the wayside. So that kind of opened my eyes a little bit more, and one thing led to another, and I got my position. Um, from a fishing perspective, I'll just tell you that somebody gave me some advice. Uh, I, uh, fishing has always been a passion of mine. As long as I can remember, I can look back at my stuff I've written and pictures I've drawn as early as I could write and draw. And it was always about fishing, always. My mom said all I ever wanted to do was fish. And I grew up in St. Cloud, so I, I, I pulled the big northerns out of Lake Georgia. You ever know Lake Georgia's? Right downtown in the middle of town there? Yep, I pulled northerns out of there, walleyes, smallmouth bass. I mean, I'd go down there as a kid, I'd bike down, and I'd just, I'd whip on those fish. Everybody else would be using a little worm, you know, and fishing for the sunfish, and I'd be whipping big crank baits, and I'd be jerking them, you know, and, and I'd be pulling big fish out of there. And uh, I, as I got a little older, my mom would let me go down the Mississippi River. And I graduated the Mississippi. Then I, when I found that river, right below the St. Cloud State there, and that dam, oh man, that's some good fishing. Still is. Uh, so I went down there, started cranking fish out of there, and then I started fishing some local fishing leagues while I was doing my real job. I, in the evenings, instead of going to a pool or a dart league, I'd do a fishing league. Where uh, Thursday nights from 6 until 9, we'd go to a different lake and we accumulated points throughout the year for fishing. And I started doing pretty good in that, so finally I went up to the MTT, the Minnesota Tournament Trail, and then I started doing the professional walleye trail as an amateur. And I started pulling these pros and I said, hey, you know, I'm here to learn. I'm also here to figure out if I should split the switch into the pro. And a lot of them said, well, what are you doing in your real job? And I said, well, I got a college education. Here's what I do. And they said, <laughs> keep doing what you're doing, make your money, it's guaranteed, and do your fishing on the side. Find a way for your outlet that's less risky. So I, I did that. I kept my real job, paid the bills, you know, got me ahead, and then I would do my tournament fishing, and I got a, you know, I, I guided, because I have a captain's license from the Coast Guard, I did that, I pursued that, and uh, and I was safe. And I always seemed that when I was fishing against other guys, I always had, you know, I always was in a pretty good financial position compared to some of the guys I fished with who maybe went full-time fishing. You know? So, uh, so I, I took my passion of sports and fishing in this case, and I did it as a sideline, and kind of set myself up and position myself. I never really knew that I'd get a position in doing this as a career, but you know, sometimes uh, you, you put things in place and things work out. Um, my typical work day, um, 
as executive director, really, the way it works is I represent 53 different resorts and hotels up in Lake of the Woods County. And Lake of the Woods, if you don't know, it's a really big lake up on the Canadian border. You know that little tip of Minnesota that jarts up into Canada? That's Lake of the Woods. We're the most northern point of the continental United States there is. And, uh, right, we, we call ourselves the walleye capital of the world. We have the highest catch rate of walleyes of anywhere in the Midwest. Right now, our fishery is absolutely on fire. I mean, their bite was so good, you could catch one on a hot dog. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. But uh, uh, honestly, uh, it, it is a great, great fishery. And uh, what I do is, you know, I do everything, anything I can to achieve our mission. And, and our mission up at Lake of the Woods is really <coughs> to bring awareness and people and goodwill and reputation up to our area. And, uh, you know, so everything from putting together a, an advertising plan to, um, you know, deciding what niches we should go into, the, the pro angler niche. People who don't fish very much will go vacation with us. Um, social media, you know, uh, the print, TV, um, digital media. What relationship should we be forming? Uh, just, you know, so like, I have an assistant director and another part-timer who work up in Butte. So I work out of my home, between my home office in St. Cloud, and between my office up in Butte. I get up there about every, uh, about every three. So um, my day is everything from advertising to today I had, I don't know if you guys ever saw the show, uh, Fishing in the Midwest with Bob Jensen. Bob Jensen called up today. He wants to sell me a TV spot. He wants to come up and do a TV show with me and advertise Lake of the Woods. Um, we're going to have Midwest Outdoors come up to our, our you know, if you guys fish at all, uh, I just had, uh, I just spent some time on ice with uh, Mike Gofron, who's a, one of the, the top pro walleye anglers ever. He's from Antioch, Illinois, and Mark Grumba from Ohio. I had those guys up on the ice, and consequently, they're going to bring a, uh, an ice fishing school to Lake of the Woods. They're going to bring two of them to Lake of the Woods. So if you want to go elbow to elbow with the best of the best and go out and really hammer some walleyes 20 miles out on ice with snowmobiles and portable fish houses, that's what they're going to be doing next winter. Um, I also just attracted a, a major walleye tournament to Lake of the Woods. So August of this year, we're going to have the AIM Pro Walleye Series come to Lake of the Woods. It's a three-day professional tournament. Um, we'll have 50 to 60 pros come with their 50 to $70,000 boats. And they'll come seven days ahead of time and they'll fish this tournament for three days. And they say economic economic impact to the area is over $300,000 because of the hotels, gas, bait, food, and incidentals. And I think that's a marketing play. I think it's probably only half that much, but still at 150, 160, it's not a bad gig for a small community like Budette and, and the resorts that we, we service. So it kind of gives you a little piece of what I do. Awesome. Hi everybody, I'm Jen Myers. I graduated from St. Ben's in 2003 with a degree in psychology. I ran on the track team at St. Ben's in my senior year. I took a sports psychology class, which paired my love of psychology and my pair of uh, love of sports together and realized, like, gosh, you can do this for a career. So not knowing what I wanted to do when I graduated, like, which is totally fine. I know a lot of people have that, so don't panic. I said, I'll just do more school. So I went down to Minnesota State University, Mankato. I got my master's degree there. Um, I was awarded a graduate assistantship. If you guys are ever thinking about graduate school, you should do um, your best to investigate all avenues that you can without having to pay for it. Because lots and lots of schools will be willing to pay you to come there, uh, do their program, and then you work for a department. So I actually got to work for their campus recreation department. So I was in charge of the swimming pool, uh, fitness classes, um, and some personal training services, and that master's degree, um, I originally thought I would do um, work with either college sports or professional sports. I was very interested in kind of the psychological aspects of why people compete, you know, what motivates people, why do some people um, succeed under pressure and some people don't succeed under pressure. But as I worked more and more with the college population, I found it very interesting just uh, fitness and wellness in general and people uh, at a college age, again, what gets some of them into the gym, what gets some of them not into the gym, what motivates them to exercise and how can I help instill those lifelong habits in people in their college age years? Because what I found from my own experience is that the stuff that you get to experience in college is most likely what you're going to take with you after college. So if you can help people um, choose to get physically healthy and give them answers to their questions now, hopefully that will lead them to healthier lives um, down the road. So I was fortunate enough that a uh, full-time position opened up just when I finished my graduate assistantship, so I applied for it. And I was given the fitness and wellness coordinator position I've been there for seven full-time years already. I can't believe it. Um, I feel like I still go to college, and sometimes people ask me, you know, like, oh, are you a freshman? Which always makes me feel really good. I'm like, oh, thank you. No, I work here, but 
you know, I talk to your 18-year-old children. So I didn't realize that um, working at a university was actually a job. You know, like you guys walk around school all day and you see all these people, but I don't think it sunk in for me that, oh, I could do this and I could work at a university and be employed here. Um, I, I didn't realize that until my master's program came along and I was like, oh my gosh, I can stay at college because I had so much fun there the first time around, I just don't want to leave. So a typical day for me includes doing personal training sessions with um, students, faculty, and staff members. I've, uh, since I've been there, in invented or I guess started up some fitness incentive programs like we have Maverick Boot Camp. So Mavericks is the um, mascot for Minnesota State University Mankato. And Boot Camp is an eight week kind of biggest loser type program. Um, and we have different teams that do it in different competitions and it gets pretty heated. Um, and the teams come and, and love the different challenges they get. So that's a part of my job. I write up exercise plans for people. So I'll see people come into my office that say, hey, I want to run a marathon and I have no idea where, I, where to start. I don't, I don't even know how to run a mile. And I get people who say, I was an athlete in high school. Uh, I am not an athlete in college and I'm totally lost. Somebody help me. You know, I used to have three hours of my day planned every day and now I have all this free time. What do I do with myself? I have people who say, I want to learn how to use the weight room. I'm scared of lifting weights, but I know it's important for me. I have people who are overweight. I have people who want to gain weight. So that's very fun for me to try to solve those pieces of the puzzle. And then also use that, that psychology behind it to figure out, okay, well, what's going to motivate these people? For some reason, they came into my office. You know, what got them here in the first place? And how can I help them so that they realize that fitness is going to be their own lifelong journey, not something that I'm making them do? So that's a big part of my day is education. Um, tours of, the, of our, our facilities, you know, to show people how to use the equipment. Uh, teaching some fitness classes. I teach classes for credit. Um, and then just for the fun of it as well, I have a class called the Accumulator that I teach once a week. It's a circuit training class. We do stuff like burpees and wall sits and jump squats and very athletic based, but people love it. And they keep coming back week after week. So it's very fun and very rewarding for me to see people um, take an interest in, you know, hopefully starting a healthy lifestyle. Um, I'm in charge of our lifeguards. I'm in charge of, like I said, our personal trainers. I'm in charge of special events. Like we have a triathlon every year. This year we're going to start our own little mud run. It's going to be a mini warrior dash, so not quite as high tech as like electric wires and, and mud slides and stuff, but we're going to run down a ravine and we're going to have a big gong that people are going to hit at the end and we have a balance beam. And if anybody wants to come, it's April 28th. It's only $15 and you get a free shirt and Mankato is only two hours from here. Um, so fun things like that. That is what I get to do at my job. Uh, I get to wear sweatpants to work. So again, I never thought that I could make a career out of exercise and get paid for it, uh, and I love it, but I, I, uh, it's very fun for me to be surrounded with a community of people who really believe that you know, fitness and a healthy lifestyle is going to get you um, far in life. So uh, that is my job in a nutshell, but every day is different. Um, I work the typical 8, eight o'clock to 5 o'clock, which is nice, you know, some weekend stuff and some later night stuff, um, but it's great to be able to reach a wide variety of students, faculty, and staff members, and community members. and, and uh, help them learn through the education that I've received. So that's, that's my story. Cool. A lot of neat stories. <laughs> um, my name is Patrick McCarty. I work for a martial art outfitter. So we design and build martial art gyms, uh, supply equipment. Um, my education background is uh, I was a communication major and philosophy minor. Um, it, in, like a lot of these people, it's not really a, your expected path, I guess. but. I went into corporate America. I worked for Emerson, which was a $23 billion company. I uh, was a, an international sales analyst, which is a vague way to say that I supported um, a sales rep that covered South and Latin America. So um, as the two of us and then one other um, engineer grew that business a little bit, which was a small sector of a much bigger company. Um, I moved into um, a sales analyst position under the director of sales for um, CT Americas, which is uh, an engineering company. They do a lot of uh, mining and conveyor stuff and things like that, but number crunching basically. And I sort of fell into this, which is what I've been doing for the last three years, and this is my fourth. So it's been um, it's been interesting. It's been a ride. It's um, a changing industry. It's growing. It's evolved to. Um, I think when I started three years, um, three and a quarter years ago, it was like a $6.2 million company. And there's 12 people that work there, so it's small. So that it was a dramatic switch from this massive corporation to a smaller company, which is a path that many of you may find yourselves in or the opposite. And it's, it's different and explore it. It's, it's interesting. But anyways, um, and, and now we've grown it to about eight and a half million 
this year as projected. So it's an industry that, despite the economy, is, is booming and growing. Um, we see that, that people drop vacations. Um, you know, sorry about the fishing trip. No. <laughs> no, hopefully it's still growing. But, um, you know, some economies some in the U.S. are, are severely impacted by it. And it seems like the fitness industry isn't one of them because it's more of a lifestyle, um, especially what I do, which is, uh, you know, the martial arts side of it, where these people dedicate their life to a study and an exploration. So um, that's one as aspect where I've seen the philosophy side of things come into play, which I took from St. John's. But the communication is invaluable. Um, it's just a really huge part of what I do every day. My voice is gone partially from talking all day, partially from St. Patrick's Day, I'm sure. But, um, so my typical work day can just be really random. I ran to uh, Lowe's today, bought a can of spray paint, and next day did to a customer to fix a bag rack that got scuffed up. Um, usually I do, a lot of, I do a lot of sales, I do a lot of design work, and a little bit of consulting so my customers can be, um, you know, the small hole-in-the-wall MMA fighter gym where they kind of patch mats together and tape up old wrestling mats and you know, look to me for other supplies, and then um, it can be, you know, bigger corporations like Lifetime Fitness is a customer of mine. Um, so I get to go out to corporate later this week and, you know, rub shoulders with those guys. So normally this is what I wear to work. I just throw on a T-shirt and go in. I never know what I'm going to be doing, um, back putting bag racks together and stuff like that. Um, you know, some days I put on a suit and tie and travel a little bit. And um, so I never know, but it's interesting. But. I guess that's basically basically what I've been doing the last uh, since 2006. All right, we're going to open uh, you know, questions. So if there's any questions for the panels, feel free. I'll go back. Nobody else wants to be first. <laughs> jump on that one um, yeah I, I did not uh, did not start out uh, writing about football for a living but I was doing it on the side I was watching a lot of football I, I played football in in college and uh, my first fantasy league actually started right here at st. John's uh, the league that I have been in now for 22 years uh, 10 of the 12 guys are Johnny's uh, nine of them are original uh, at different points uh, during its uh, uh, its path we also had several Bennies who were part of it so it's been uh, a way to keep uh, friends together but as the commissioner of the league I would write up updates uh, send out a newsletter um, analyze the stats it was all stuff that I was doing on the side um, and when an opportunity presented itself for me to do that and someone would pay me for it, um, you know, it, it, it I'd been doing it all along so I had a little bit of experience in it got my foot in the door uh, with other skills I had developed um, at real jobs and uh, and was able to turn, like you said, turn a passion into um, a paycheck, which is a nice way to go through life. I mean, it's, it's fun to, uh, if I had a real job, if I was an accountant or a tax preparer or something, I would still be watching football on Sundays. I would probably still be uh, breaking down all of the different stats. I would definitely be um, in a fantasy league and for me to do that and get a paycheck, um, go on the radio and talk about it and have people um, you know, come up to me in a bar and say, hey, I, I heard you on the radio, I want to ask you, uh, how's Chris Obanaya going to do this week against uh, the Rams? You know, that's, that's pretty fun. It's, it's, uh, it's something I'd be talking about anyway. And, and again, to, to get a paycheck uh, for that, it didn't happen right away, but it's something that I kept doing for free. And then when that opportunity presented itself, it, you know, I had a chance to go for it. And John, if I may, you know, I, I know John pretty well, and, but I, I think it's a good learning lesson. Tell these guys how you got your job. Um, I was working at West Publishing. I spent a, 
about eight years there uh, marketing uh, college textbooks as a, a program uh, or promotional assistant. Uh, I had a list of about 20 textbooks that I did all the sales support and promotional materials for um, in the hours that I wasn't using my computer to analyze fantasy football stats and that kind of thing. Um, and when they were purchased by Thompson, um, Thompson already had some educational publishers, so my job was going to change. And I didn't really like where it was going, so I went looking for another job. I ended up working for another marketing firm. That marketing firm got purchased, and so I was kind of out on the street, but I had uh, about a month's severance to work with. So I thought I can be uh, a little choosy, at least uh, at the start, and what do I really want to do? And it was the start of football season. I had just received my copy of Fantasy Football Weekly magazine in the mail, and I thought, you know, this is stuff I'm already doing, and I think I write as good or better than these guys. So I went through the masthead, I found the publisher, got the address, I wrote a letter to him. Um, Paul Charchino is a publisher, I'm now co hosting a show uh, with him, and he still brings up the letter I wrote uh, to him. He still remembers, uh, I compared my skills to Randy Moss, I compared my availability as a free agent to John Randall, the famous story of him going undrafted and knocking on every door, sending a letter to every NFL team saying, um, I want to play for you, ending up with the Vikings and becoming a Hall of Famer. Um, got my foot in the door with Church, um, spent about two weeks as kind of an unpaid intern, caught them just as they were transitioning from a print product to the online website that became Fanball. Um, they hired me on as a full-time guy doing uh, their design production layout of their magazine with a little bit of writing. As they got bigger, they brought in a real designer. I did more writing. Uh, anytime they asked me, can you do this? Uh, I didn't say, no, I don't know how to do it. I said, sure, I'll give that a try. Um, a radio gig would come up, hey, do you want to go on the radio with uh, this station in, in Omaha wants to talk to somebody? Sure. I've been doing Lawrence, Kansas radio for 10 years. been doing Omaha radio for six or seven years. I've been doing the St. Cloud. I mean, those are all things I've been able to build on. So at the point where when Fanball got blown up um, by the people that bought it, um, that year I was one of three national finalists for Fantasy Football Writer of the Year. The other two are from NBC and CBS. So I was in pretty good company. Um, the fact that I no longer had a company that was employing me made me a pretty marketable guy and I signed on with The Huddle. I've been there for the last five years, just added the serious gig last year. Um, hopefully this off season we're going to be doing some promotion with uh, another guy that we played football with who works for Anheuser-Busch that just spent about $1.3 billion to be the official beer of the NFL and they're looking for a fantasy football present so leveraging uh, a Johnny tie-in and what I've been doing to you know, hopefully continue to uh, build on what I'm doing. a good question it depends on the university at Mankato we don't it's expected that you would either come in with it or get it throughout your assistantship but some places do as well and that can be kind of a bargaining chip um, you know Mankato has a great assistantship program where you get a tuition waiver and you also get a stipend there can be schools where they will waive your tuition but you don't get living expenses or there will be schools where they'll pay you a stipend but you still have to pay your tuition either in or out of state based on where you go so it is important to investigate you know well, what are these different schools going to offer me um, in relation for my slave labor when I come back and, and work for them. Um, but some do and some don't, and some, like us at MSU, that is part of my job as well as we put on personal training workshops throughout the school year. Um, one of the things we do is it's, it's a weekend workshop and I get you know two free comp registrations. So I get people um, to interview, I do a little interview process with them and I say, if you're gonna give me back you know 20 personal training hours, I will pay for the certification for you. So we kind of have a bartering system or a, or a, you know, if you do this for me, then I'll, I can guarantee you at least 20 hours of employment type thing as well. So those are all good questions to ask. Do you have a specific place you're looking? Did you? Yeah. For sports management? Yeah. Yep. Exercise science per, or exercise phys, yep. Great. Perfect. Yep, yep. 
definitely that would be the place there's a lot of people that do that a corporate and community fitness minor with a exercise phys or nutrition too so so then the next question should be hey, <laughs> come on down that's what I was gonna say about people's passion is you don't be afraid to ask people like maybe it's not obvious but I love my job and I love it when students come to me and say like, how did you get to be here? Can I shadow you or can I follow you around? Or like, I'll do anything for free just so I can get my foot in the door. So you might have to do some stuff for free, but don't be afraid to ask people. Because if people love their jobs like us, we do up here, we're gonna be happy to tell you how we got there. You know, we're not gonna say, oh, I don't have the time of day for this 18 or 19 year old. Because we were that same person at one time. So do not be afraid to ask them. They love talking about it. I do anyway. <laughs> part, of it, part of it's too, you know, part of it's not only the path you take, but part of it's how you work it. Mm -hmm. So, so use what you have, and don't underestimate the power of this alliance between between giants mm -hmm. and pennies. I mean, you know what? We're, we're part of a we're part of a group. We're part of a club, even though we don't know each other. We are. I'll tell you, if anybody comes to me from St. John or St. Ben's, man, right after that, I'm gonna do anything I can to help them, just because I feel that strong about it right here. Truly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you could hook up uh, uh, on a LinkedIn deal, if you have somebody that might be able to help you, even just uh, mentor, give you some advice, you know, perhaps. It's not what she knows who you know. You know, perhaps she can uh, introduce you to the right people in Mankato. It's not her herself. And you, you know what I mean, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, it's, 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 it really is. Great opportunity to meet. That's why you're here. You, you took the time out of your personal schedule to come here. This is the first chance. And you get to break that door down. Um, I, fitness was always a part of my life and that was a part of how I defined myself and I wanted to be able to have a job that allowed me to have that as part of part of my job. I see a lot of my friends that say, you know, I wish I could work out but I have to commute to work and I'm there from 8 to 5 and by the time I get home I gotta make supper and walk the dogs and I have no time for exercise. And I was like, well, I don't want to have a life like that. I want to have a life where the exercise or the fitness can be built into my job. So that is kind of what Taylor made me towards. Okay, well, what kind of job is going to have flexibility to allow me to do that on the job. Um, and the psychology part of it, you know, came along with it as well, realizing I had to have my own motivations for not only being on the track team and being an athlete and what drove me to do that and, and find success that way, but then so how can how can I interpret these motivations of, of other people as well and use that psychology background? So it was a good fit for me. I know it doesn't work for everybody. And, and most people, like you said, you'd think about exercise physio or physiology or exercise science. Most people in my job, that would be their degree. There's not a lot of sports psychology people that go as a fitness coordinator, but it worked for me at the time. So. Now, you're, are you yep, I've been done since 2005, so I'm a full-time employee. Um, so what's like your job? Yep, yep, the fitness coordinator, and I work in the recreation department. Don't use a lot of... Um, I'm, I hardly see athletes at all. They, they have kind of their own with athletic training and their coaches and stuff like that, but it's more the just general student population. But we have a pretty large sports psychology program as well at school, um, graduate and undergraduate as well, that's doing some cool research and stuff with runners and marathoners, and so it's an up-and-coming field, I believe, and I believe as more and more people um, get older and recognize the benefits of exercise, you know, I like to say people, uh, my parents age, like my dad maybe, who was over in the corner, um, didn't didn't necessarily grow up with the same, like we had Fayette in school and I grew up knowing about nutrition and how to choose fruits and vegetables and healthy exercise, but I think about people like my grandma who never had that kind of education in school, but are realizing the benefits of it and they're willing to pay for it, because they, they say, you know, I, don't, I didn't learn about it, but heck, I have this disposable income that I'm willing to, like you said with your martial arts too, they maybe don't know about the education part, but they're willing to pay somebody else to help them get where they want to be. So I think it's going to go nowhere but up as our population ages. Yeah. 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 One of the things for me is more so in my, in when I was an undergrad here, I had no idea that I wanted to go into sports. You know, it just was not an option in my mind. I had, I never thought about it, but um, so I had to use grad school as my chance to, you know, make a name for myself, 
find people or find connections. And uh, I know people who went to the U where I went for grad school, they went there for undergrad and grad school and got their master's and undergrad in sports management. And they don't have a job in sports management today. They wish they did. Um, my, my difference was that I told anyone that I would be willing to do whatever I could to get myself experience. I would scrub toilets. I know that was not an option to work in sports, but if I had to, I would, and I would work for no money. I would work any hours, and I still do. I still, I feel like even though I have a full-time job, I have a few other side jobs, just because I, I like being involved in that environment so much, and I'm willing to do anything I can to improve myself and get better. So it's just, you know, you have to put yourself in a position that you are available, and everyone says that, you know, just take advantage of all your opportunities and get involved in everything you can, and it's not necessarily, you know, it could be, sometimes it's who you know, sometimes it's what you did that gets you to the next level. It's just taking advantage of what you have, whether it is who you know or what you did. So for me, it's not anything specific getting involved in, it's just letting people know that you are available to do whatever you need, if that's your passion, you're willing, you're going to be able to, you know, you'll, you'll be successful as long as you're willing to step up and, you know, do whatever it takes. You might even be talking, it reminds me of, you guys ever heard the saying, a lot of acronyms around stuff like, you know, successful people are willing to do what unsuccessful people are not willing to do. And, you know, somehow you got to set yourself apart, because there's going to be people competing for, you know, that are in the same majors as you, and competing for the same jobs you're competing for, and, Gotta ask yourself, how can I set myself apart? And I think that's a great point. Whatever it takes, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever it takes. And you'll see too when you apply. A lot of people want jobs in athletics. What you know, no matter what it is. Um, so it's just the pool for people applying is so much that you have to set yourself apart. It's just you know the the stacks for when I was an, just an intern. The stack of resumes that that were you know people who applied was astronomical. And you so you're so dispensable that you need to really set yourself apart and show you know like when you do have an opportunity take advantage of it I right now we have our intern and um, who you know has the same position I had last year and she was not planning on working in sports and she probably isn't gonna work in sports after this but she wanted to try it out and she said she was gonna be willing to do whatever she could and so she set herself apart and we weeded through tons and tons of applications and we found someone because she did. She she had things on her resume that other people wouldn't. It's just so easy because so many people apply. It's just you have to have something on there that makes you stand out. pretty critical with your first job. Mm -hmm. um, after that, you're going to have a whole lot of things. It's going to clutter up your resume, and that'll get pushed off the end of the list. But um, it, it's just like it was in high school to get into college. You know, you want to you want to fill it with a, as many things as you can and diverse diversify your things. So um, the athletic stuff is great, but try to do other things that maybe show um, other leadership potential. Uh, and there's there's no shortage of that sort of thing in St. John's, which is a great thing about the university. And, and two, not just for your resume, but for, for personal growth and stuff. I've found it to be um, just an amazing experience doing whatever you can. Sur like a single service trip you could put on there, uh, something like that, instead of spring break you'll never regret. Um, you know, a, a club where you're, you know, you show up as much as you can, just show up and contribute and be of value. Don't just sit in a chair to put on your resume, but stuff like that is going to give back to you more than you ever put into it. So. That'd be my advice. And even if you don't have time to join a club, you know, there's activities all, all the time, you know, a 5K race somewhere where you can volunteer for one day. It's not a club that you have to go to once a week or anything like that. So it's, it's less of a commitment, but it's still something you put on your resume. And if there's not something that exists, create it. I mean, uh, when we did the, the television show, um, we set up a slam dunk contest. 
So, you know, there wasn't a slam dunk club or anything, but, you know, that, that would be something if I'm looking at a resume, uh, set up the 2012 St. John, St. Thomas slam dunk challenge. I'm going to ask you about that, you know? I mean, pick something that interests you that maybe if there's not another opportunity, then you can do it on your own time, um, how you see fit, and then, uh, you know, spice it up however you need to so it takes you into a strength when you're talking to someone and they're going to ask you, tell me about so the time you did this and then you're speaking from a strength already plus it's something that separates you out from this big stack of resumes that they're reading through. And, and I would say, all that's in my degree is everything. But the other thing I would say is that you know, if you're a two-sport athlete in college, you know what, you can put that on a resume and nobody even get missed. And you got to sell it. you got to make sure people understand it. Hey, listen, you know, I, uh, I happen to be a two-sport athlete in college and, you know, as you probably understand, college athletics are pretty demanding and, you know, uh, that meant I had to do this, that, and everything else. I'm here as a captain, I did this, I've added my accolades. And you know what, I, I gotta tell you honestly, I probably learned as much from athletics, dealing with pressure, pressure situations, being behind the eight ball, dealing with different members of my team, creating teamwork. I probably learned as much that way as honestly, I probably did academically. But I feel like that really prepared me for my next step in life. And I'll tell you what, I'm just eager to take this next step in my career as it was stepping out of the field. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Sell what you got. Even if you don't have athletics in your resume, it's okay, you have something else then. Sell what you got. And the other thing you want to do is take a look at your audience and say, what are they looking for? And tell them what they want to hear. You ever heard of that radio station, WIIFM? It's the one that most everybody listens to. It's what's in it for me. That's human nature. People are all saying, what's in it for me? So if I'm an employer, and I'm looking at the stack of resumes, and I'm looking at these candidates, I'm saying, all right, who's going to make my job easier? <laughs> exactly. Who's going to make me the most money? <laughs> Who, who's going to last? Who's going to have longevity? Who's going to give me the fewest headaches? Mm -hmm. Who's going to be who's going to be the the, the least uh, have the least drama going on in their life? When all these different things play a part, I'm thinking about all these things that I read in a resume and interview. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Jen, uh, first, I guess it's a two-part question. What does your job look like in the summer when school's out, and what would say a student interested in an internship mm -hmm. in the summer? Yep. Yep. The summer is not a, that's part of the reason why I like working at a college because it kind of ebbs and flows along with college life. So we get a nice winter break. And I work during the summer. I have a 12 month contract. It's definitely not as busy it is, as it is during the school year. Um, MSU does offer summer classes. So our, our gym space is open. So there are students that are on campus. It's a little different than St. John's and St. Ben's where the majority aren't on campus. So I'm still doing fitness assessments and meeting with people for personal training and exercise plans and nutrition plans and things like that. Just a smaller scale. Um, we're pretty involved with um, new first year um, orientation. So all the freshmen students that are gonna come and hopefully come in the fall actually come on campus for a two day orientation. The campus recreation department plays a big role in that. Um, as well as fulfilling some of their time for their day, so we do some activities with them. Um, summertime is the time to be able to plan, so a lot of planning that does, can't happen during the school year goes on, so planning for these races and, and getting things in order, group fitness schedule, etc. cetera. Um, I do have interns during the summer. Usually I have just one. It's unpaid, unfortunately, unpaid internship, but they'd be with me you know, 10 hours a week if they were looking for three or four credits. Um, helping with fitness assessments, helping to write up exercise prescriptions, um, helping introduce people to using the machines in the, in the recreation center, um, perhaps teaching a fitness class or doing some personal training if they're certified, um, but there's definitely those options, even if it was, you know, for part of a summer or four weeks or something like that as well. So. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't go to grad school. Um, I'm thinking about it. I would, uh, I, I guess, personally, depending on your financial situation, uh, St. John's will take a ding out of that. Uh, <laughs> Keep yeah. going to school, though. You can defer the loans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. scores go forever. That's a great point. Um, that's a really great point. Is one you can defer those loans. So if you want to get on top of it right away, and you and you really know what you want to do, 
uh, just pull the trigger on it, go for it. It'll never be a bad investment. Right. Um, but if you don't know what you want to do and you're not really sure that, um, in the, if you end up in a corporate position, a lot of times they'll pay for it. So use that, you know, to your advantage. And um, you know, it's usually like a partial thing. Like um, I'm, the first company I worked for it would do like six grand a year. And I was about to start it, and I had, had this other opportunity come up. Um, I recently asked if they'd pay for my MBA, um, and they said yes. So um, even a small company, it can happen. Um, just kind of the same thing you, you were saying is just convince them of you know what their value is going to be out of out of you know uh, your efforts to do that because it is a it is a big commitment and you got to be ready for it. So and you and you learn a ton. You learn a ton your first couple years. Every year, I suppose, but your first couple of years are like it's a massive undertaking for sure. Different lifestyle completely. Comes down to ROI, doesn't it? Return on investment. Absolutely. They're taking a look and saying, all right, because a lot of companies now have really cut back because of the times. So a lot of companies, a lot of companies now maybe would have offered, you know, an employee, uh, you know, a free MBA if they're the right kind of employee. But it's not that easy anymore. Maybe they're offering just a small part portion of. of uh, tuition or something, you know, so it's a little different. You know, the one thing I would say is, I would say, hey, what makes sense, you know? So you, the questions I would ask would be, all right, you know, what, what are your options coming out of college? Um, do you have a job set up? Do you think the job market's strong? You know, if the job market's not strong and you're not confident you're going to get a job, you know, maybe it is a good time to go to school. Keep on cranking. Uh, at the same time, the advantages of, for, for, I can speak for myself, I was out of school 10 years before I went back to my MBA. And for an MBA, it was nice for me to have 10 years of work experience because when I got into my MBA, all the different classes taught about, to me, my undergrad for business or management taught me what the tools were. My master's degree taught me really how to use the tools. And the fact that I was in the work world for 10 years and had just, you know, I guess because I just lived it, I had an idea of what accounting, how accounting worked with this. My MBA made a lot more sense to me. If I'd have come out of school to take my MBA, I still would have been focused on what's going on this weekend, where are the beer specials uh, Thursday night, uh, and all, I want to learn too. But I don't want to tell you this, but I just ten years later in life for me personally, mm -hmm. I was just just in a different place mentally that I wanted to learn. You know, St. John's, I mean, I, I made it through when I had decent grades, but it was always hard for me. Gosh, when I got my MBA, man, I flew through. But you know why? It's amazing what happened when I go to the work, go to work during the workday, and I'd, I'd go get a quick bite to eat. I'd come back and spend three hours in my office all by myself and actually read every word I was supposed to read. My gosh, those conversations <laughs> in class make more sense. I mean, the test even made sense. Does that make sense? <laughs> a lot of life has to do with time and place. Not that you guys would ever do that. But you know, sometimes you know when you're when you're in certain, you get under the pinch, and it's it's regurgitation, right? You, know, you crammed a couple nights before, and it's what you can remember for that test. But if I asked you a week or ten days after that test was taken, how much do you really understand on the topic? Different deal, isn't it? So, anyway. Yeah, there's no right or wrong answer. I don't think it's all about yourself. But for me, if I would have went right into the work world, I would probably in a be in a job that I hate because my my master or my major was in accounting, and I do not enjoy that. So I probably would have been forced or felt that I was forced to keep or continue doing that. So now I feel that even though I was young and um, I didn't have much experience, it was a good decision for me to go right away. Well, we'll close down the um, Q&A. Um, panels, thank you so much for coming up. Um, if this was honestly the best year that I've ever been with this panel. Yeah, so thank you so much. <laughs>